Hi, welcome back. We're on Lecture 4, Segment 3, the final segment of Lecture 4. Here, we'll take a more conceptual approach to correlation and talk about how to interpret correlations and how to interpret arguments based on correlational analyses. The important topics to take away from this segment are validity and reliability, not in a measurement sense, but just with respect to correlations and, and correlation-based arguments. So let me first talk about validity. There are a lot of assumptions underlying a correlation analysis that often aren't discussed when a correlation is presented in the media or even in, in research presentations. I want to focus on three important ass uh, assumptions here. One, we assume that we have normal distributions in both variables x and y. Two, we assume that we have a linear relationship between x and y. And three, there's an assumption called homoskedasticity. <laughs> Fun word to say. And I'll show you uh, what I mean by homoskedasticity in a moment. Uh, more importantly, and this is, an, this is critical for just consumers of statistical information, the validity of any argument that's, that comes from a correlational analysis depends on these assumptions. So these assumptions need to be met for an, uh, that the argument to have any weight. So let's walk through each one of these. The first one is pretty easy to deal with, and you could deal with that uh, based on what you learned in Lecture 2. We assume that x and y are normally distributed, at least for the type of correlation coefficient that we've been discussing today. Uh, how would we detect a violation of that assumption? Well, we could just run descriptive statistics. Right? We could plot histograms, and we could use the describe function in R to get the mean the standard deviation uh, and values representing skew and kurtosis to determine it if it is a normal distribution or not. So this is all just running descriptives to figure out if you truly have normal distributions. What about the second assumption? Do we truly have a linear relationship? So far we've only been talking about correlations that depict linear relationships between x and y, or linear functions between x and y. How do we know if we violated that assumption? Well, just look at the scatter plot. Does the scatter plot look like there's a linear relation, or does it look like it has a more complex function between x and y? So a simple way is to look at a scatter plot. We'll look at an example of that in a second. Another way, though, is to plot what are called residuals. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more here in this segment, but a lot more uh, going forward in the class. And finally, there's this assumption of homoskedasticity. How do you detect if you violated that one? Same thing as uh, the linear relationship. Look at the scatter plot, look at the residuals. But what is homoskedasticity? Uh, I'll, I'll show you in a scatter plot in a moment. First, what I'd like to show you is just what do I mean by linear, nonlinear? Up to this point, I've just been showing you linear relationships, this regression line going through dots on scatter plots. But there's all sorts of possibilities for taking a variable x and relating it to y. Right? So y is just a function of x. For those of you with a math background, we would just write y equals f of x. There's all sorts of possibilities, uh, more than just a, a straight line. So here's a fun example, this cartoon, uh, where we're predicting programming skill as a function of blood alcohol concentration. <laughs> so there's this idea that if you drink a little bit, then you become a little bit less inhibited, and you actually get a little bit better at writing code. Because writing code is like learning a new language. Right? The same thing holds for learning a new language. You might be really nervous and afraid of saying the wrong thing at first, have a couple glasses of wine, and then you relax 
and you do a little bit better at learning the language. The same idea has been put out there in terms of learning to write code. Uh, so when you sit down to do your R homework, maybe have a glass of wine. Not too much. <laughs> uh, especially, I wouldn't recommend this, uh, this level. <laughs> um, so the idea here is that as blood alcohol concentration increases, Initially, there's a bit of a drop in programming skill, but then there's this sweet spot. If you get just the right buzz, then you can really write code, right? Uh, of course, this is a, this is a cartoon. <laughs> Don't take this seriously. Uh, and then, of course, it drops off quickly. Um, but that's obviously a function that's not linear. Here's a more serious example of a nonlinear relationship from psychology. So there's lots of research to suggest that your performance in certain settings, in, in school or in work, uh, if, we're, if we're trying to predict how stressful uh, that, that situation is, um, is a function of your experience in that setting, but it's not a linear function. So when you have very little experience, you don't know what's going on, <laughs> you're not stressed out. As you get a little bit of experience, you know what's happening, you know who to be aware of, and it's a very stressful environment. But then when you get to be an expert or an old man in the field, um, you have a lot of experience and you experience less stress. There are a lot of examples from psychology where you get this quadratic function between two variables rather than a linear function. So that brings me back to this new word, homoskedasticity. What does that mean? I'll try to describe it in words, but it's best described by looking at a scatter plot. In words, it just means for each dot in a scatter plot, if we look at the difference, the distance between the dot and the regression line, that represents the prediction error or the residual. If it's homoscedastic, then those distances are not a function of x. They're not related to the predictor variable. If they were, then you might have a confound in your study. So let's go back and look at the scatter plot uh, relating working memory capacity to SAT. If I wanted to predict an individual person's SAT score on the basis of their working memory capacity, say this person right here. The way I do that is I would go to their working memory score, which is around 0.7, then go to the regression line, and then over to SAT, and I would predict that they'd get about a 2100 on the SAT, on the basis of their working memory score. But you see this person actually almost aced the SAT. They did much better than 2100. So the distance between this point and the regression line, that's the prediction error or residual for that individual. The idea of homoskedasticity is that those distances are not a function of x, meaning as I go across the entire distribution of x, the distances don't either get greater or they don't get lower. They're just sort of random across the entire distribution of x. If they changed as a function of x, that would tell me that there's something systematic going on, that my prediction errors are related to one of the variables of, of interest. That sometimes happens, and that's an interesting outcome, uh, but it violates the assumption of homoskedasticity. That would be heteroskedasticity. So just remember that the validity of any argument based on correlational analyses depends on all these assumptions. It depends on having normal distributions in x and y, having a linear relationship if we're talking about doing correlations uh, the way we've done them here in this lecture, and it depends on this assumption of homoskedasticity. The last thing I want to do in this lecture is talk about the reliability of a correlation.
So we may look at one sample and see that two variables are correlated, but is that reliable? So if I go to another sample and measure the same two variables, will I get the same correlation coefficient? Probably not because of sampling error, right? It might fluctuate somewhat. But will it fluctuate so much that I would say it's not a reliable correlation? How do we make that call? That's a tough question, and different statisticians take different approaches to this. One approach that I'll describe here uh, is NHST, which refers to Null Hypothesis Significance Testing. And the way this works is in Null Hypothesis Significance Testing, which is a mouthful, so I'll just say NHST, we assume the null hypothesis. We su we'll assume there's no correlation between X and Y. Let's just assume that. And then the alternative hypothesis is that there's a positive correlation, say, between, say, working memory capacity and SAT. What we'll then do is conduct a study, observe the correlation, and then we can calculate the probability of that outcome given the assumption that the null is true. If you remember from lecture two, when we started to talk about probability, we can use the normal distribution and what we know about its distribution, its, its properties, how, what percentage of scores fall in certain regions. We can use that and probability theory to answer these questions. So let me remind you of that example. Remember, I did a histogram of body temperature. And that was just a distribution of individuals. So I had a bunch of students and assume I got their body temperature by using that infrared wand. And we had a nice normal distribution uh, of body temperature. And then I asked questions like, well, if I pick one student from the room at random, what was the probability that, what would, what's the probability that their body temperature would be greater than 100 which was about the average in that case, the probability of that was 0.5 if 100 was the average. But if you remember, my most extreme example was, what's the probability that I, I pick someone at random, what's the probability that their temperature is greater than 103? Well, the assumption was that we were dealing with a normal distribution of healthy people. Right? What's the probability that I'd get someone with a temperature of 103? Well, we calculated it. The probability was less than 0.01, extremely unlikely, right? What that means is my assumption that that group was healthy, that everyone in that group was healthy, is probably wrong, right? So we, we would want to reject that because the probability of that outcome was so low that something was going wrong, and it, we, it's cause for concern. That's exactly what we're going to do here, but at the level of samples. So I can look at the probability of a certain outcome under the assumption that the correlation is zero. And if I observe a correlation of something like 0.8, then that's just so extreme. That's such an extreme outcome that I would reject the null hypothesis and say, that can't be. So if you're playing this game, and I often call it a game because uh, there, are, there are some tricks underlying NHST, which we'll get to. But if you are doing NHST, then you will wind up in, in one of four outcomes. Because you, as the experimenter, you have to make a decision to either retain the null or reject the null. And in fact, the truth is that the null is either true or false. So you can think of these two rows here. Think of those as like two alternate universes. So they can't coexist. The null is either true or, or it's false. And you, the experimenter, have to decide which is right. So if you're living in the world where the null is true and you retain the null, then great, you made the correct decision. Uh, but if you're living in the world where the null is true and you reject, then that's a, what statisticians call a type one error or, or a false alarm. You, you've said, hey, look, I got this significant correlation and I got this significant effect. 
uh, when in fact in uh, the population that effect doesn't really exist. Go down to the bottom row, if you, the experimenter, made the decision to retain the null when in fact it's false, then you've missed an opportunity, and that's a type 2 error. But if you rejected it when in fact it's false, then great, you've made the correct decision. So if you do this, you're going to wind up in one of these, one of these four outcomes. What's nice is, given the assumptions of the normal distribution and using normalized scores, we know the probability of winding up in one of those four boxes, or we can estimate them. So we know the risks we're running for a type 1 error and a type 2 error as researchers. So let's go back to that normal distribution. If I assume this distribution, I could assume that right here the correlation is zero in the middle of this distribution. What that means is if I did the study over and over and over again, then I would get correlations assuming the null, assuming the null hypothesis, assuming the correlation is zero. I would see samples with slight positive correlations, slight negative correlations, but overall they'd mostly fall around zero. Every once in a while, I get one sort of further out into the extremes. I can calculate the probability of all of those outcomes. That's the point. So if the null is true, if, it's, if the distribution of samples is really like this, then getting, get, if, I, if I find a correlation that's really high or really low, then I'll wind up rejecting the null, but that's just a mistake. It's like getting that one student who has the really high body temperature, but then finding out that they tricked you and sort of uh, like you know, put, put, some, uh, put something on their head to heat it up so that it would screw up your measurement. Um, it was just a fluke, right? They weren't really sick. Uh, that can happen. They're type 1 errors. What we can do as experimenters is we can set a value called alpha. We can pick that level, and it's typically 0.05. And then we know what's the probability of making a type 1 error. It's 0.05. That's low enough that we live with it. And we can also estimate the probability of making a type 2 error, but that depends on how much power we have in our experiment. And we'll get to that in... Uh, a, a lecture uh, when we talk about um, sampling and uh, statistical power. So to wrap this up, how do we know if a correlation is reliable or significant? Well, we calculate this p-value based on where it falls given the assumptions, and Technically speaking, that p-value is a conditional probability. So the top line here says the p-value that you see, and this is the p-value that you see reported in, in research, is it's a conditional probability. It's the probability of obtaining these data. That's what D stands for. It's the probability of getting this outcome given, that's what the vertical bar stands for, given that the null hypothesis is true. That's what the p-value stands for. And typically, if that p-value, that probability, is less than 0.05, then we say, hey, this is statistically significant. Let's reject the null. And then you get to publish your paper in a nice journal. <laughs> um, it's important, though, to remember that that's what the p-value is, that it's the probability of the data given the null. It's not the probability that the null hypothesis of the null hypothesis being true. It's not the probability about a hypothesis. It's the probability about an observation given a hypothesis. That's a subtle difference and a really important one, and one that statisticians argue over for day in and day out and for years. Uh, a lot of statisticians want to flip that around and say, hey, I don't want to know about the probability of an outcome. I want to know about the probability of a hypothesis. Uh, that's called the Bayesian approach, and we'll get to that at the very end of the semester. So this can be applied to a correlational analysis. 
we could observe a correlation, calculate the p-value, and see if it's significantly different from zero. If so, that tells me that it's reliable. Okay? So there's a way to get at reliability. We could also apply it to comparing two correlations. So we could say, is one correlation significantly larger than another? Uh, just a final note on correlations. I'm, I'm sticking for now with the Pearson product moment correlation. Uh, that assumes we have two variables, x and y, that are continuous. There are other correlation coefficients we could calculate. So the point by serial, if we have one variable that's continuous and one that's categorical, we could calculate the phi coefficient when they're both dichotomous, or we could calculate the Spearman rank correlation uh, if they're both ordinal or rank variables. Most of the examples you'll see in research are uh, Pearson's product moment correlation. That's why I emphasize uh, that one in the introduction to correlations here. So final slide, the important topics to take away is we should always be evaluating the validity of correlation-based arguments because they rely upon so many assumptions. So you have to dig into the data and see whether those assumptions have been met or not. And we have very uh, straightforward ways of estimating the reliability of a correlation.